It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join for Reflections in Time. often interesting and sometimes exciting to look at the past of things like our University of Nebraska at Omaha and University of Omaha as we've known it in years gone by. But with this particular segment of videotape, we try to go into the past and talk to people in the present who've lived through a lot of life and also a lot of time with the University of Nebraska at Omaha and of course often with the University of Omaha. And that's the kind of person who's with me in this particular recording in the summer of 1982. He's Don Flaster, my friend and colleague for some 20, 25 to 30 years. Don's retired now, but he spent lots of years at the university, not only as a teacher, a coach, a, well, he'll tell us about all the various jobs he had, but he was there in the 30s, as I recall, as a student. Don, I'm glad you could sit down and chat with me today. What is your first memory of any sort of the University of Omaha? Where did it happen, when yeah. did it happen, what? Well, I think, Paul, I, I recall, I had the rare experience of being at both the old university out on North 24th yeah. Street, 24th and Pratt, and the new university, as we call it then, that we moved out there in 1938. But uh, I, uh, I recall the, the old university is, uh, the facilities we had were quite limited. What was it like up on North 24th there? Oh, it was, uh, we had, we had one, we really had more buildings than we had out at the, uh, when we moved out on Dodge. Were, we they, about, were they all in one place or were they spread around? No, we had about three buildings on the campus. There was a li I well, laughingly, a library. It was a, a kind of a Quonset hut. Yeah. And uh, it was a wooden building. And then they had the administration building. And then they had a, a hall they called Jocelyn Hall. Yeah. And that was used as an auditorium and a gym. But it wasn't legal size, although we played basketball games on there. It was a little small? It was small. And they had a balcony over it, and uh, the opposition, uh, it took them a while to adjust to that balcony. <laughs> but they were going in for layups. And a that. little bit hard yeah. to handle. But uh, I, uh, I uh, recall that we also had uh, uh, a building. They condemned a grade school. Uh, Saratoga Grade School yeah. at 24th and Ames. They condemned the grade school. and. Uh, the university took over it as a science hall, and that was also where our athletic uh, uh, locker room was. I was talking to a fellow the other night. He talked about that building. Yeah. He'd go over there for a class or so. Right. And yeah. uh, the FIAD and that sort of stuff was there, huh? Yes. Uh, right across from the car barn, wasn't it? That's right. For the street and, car. Uh, there were some of the athletes uh, that stayed over the, uh, uh, the they had a, uh, well, I guess it was a post office. Down below and up above, they had apartments, and some of the athletes stayed there. They served horrible food. They fixed it themselves. <laughs> I ate there several times, and uh, uh, it was uh, edible, but just barely. Now, you were a North Omaha boy, so the university was really almost at home, wasn't it? Right. I, uh, I graduated from North High in uh, 1936, and then I attended Creighton for a year, and then I came back to uh, the old Omaha U in 37. Now, uh, in those early years of your life in at North High School and on into to Creighton and then in the University of Omaha. You were always interested in sports, weren't you? Yes, I was. Uh, Where'd that start and why did it start? Do you have any idea? Well, I played uh, in the, at North High. I, I played basketball. And I was fortunate enough to make All-State a couple of years and I played football. And that was the reason I quit Creighton is because uh, they had me there on a basketball scholarship and I, I preferred uh, to play uh, football also. Uh -huh. And so uh, I thought that since I wanted to go out and teach and coach that uh, uh, that I would, uh, you know, prefer to uh, get a little experience in, in football. And, uh, but the athletics has changed considerably uh, from today out at the university and when I was there. Yeah, when well, you were playing football, and I just picture this in my mind as a boy, to see people in football uniforms, the equipment was really different, wasn't yes, it? Yes, all the equipment was, uh, 
We had different kinds of helmets, as I remember. Pretty soft, weren't they? Well, they were soft and not all the same. It looked, uh, <laughs> uh, well, some of the, the uh, movies that I've seen that they took then, uh, it looks like long, hardy movies, really. <laughs> uh, we weren't, uh, well, I will say this, and in defense of all those fellows that played at that time, we were pretty well schooled, though, in fundamentals, tackling and blocking that. But uh, our team was not near the caliber. We we didn't have the numbers. Uh, How many men did you have out for football? Oh, there was, uh, if, we got, if we got uh, 20, if when we'd go on a trip and we could take 25 men, we felt we were pretty well fortified. But, of course, everybody played all the time, didn't they? Offense right. and defense. That's right. They... Uh, uh, we didn't have, in those days, we didn't have specialists, uh, no. you know, somebody come in and do the kicking or somebody doing uh, so the end runs or whatever. Yeah. You, you played yeah. both ways. Yeah. You played both ways. But the facilities were bad. Uh, the practice facilities, uh, we were kind of a no-man group. Uh, we even practiced over at Exarbon. And uh, I think uh, I probably said this before, but uh, uh, they had... Uh, polos, uh, ponies over there, you know, they played polo, and we had to wait to get on the field to, after they, George Brandeis and some of those people got off. Wait know. a minute, they had a polo field over there? They had Never a, heard of that. Yeah, they had a polo field, it was right on, Where the uh, racetrack is now, maybe? No, it was towards Center Street. Yeah? Towards Center Street, and uh, uh, it was, they had pretty good tour, turf, it got a lot of uh, fertilization, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we played... Uh, We'd play there. I, it's a wonder we all didn't catch pneumonia. We went over there in a truck, an open truck. An open truck. And that sometimes it would be a little bit cold, <laughs> and you would be sweaty, and you'd jump on that truck and and, and ride back to the university. This was uh, when we were out on Dodge now, I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, if you missed the truck, then you had the opportunity to uh, run. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's why we never had anybody stay after practice and practice. They made the truck. Thing. We didn't, <laughs> didn't want to miss the truck. Another, another thing I think that uh, I remember that's quite a bit different is uh, the uh, the scholarship program. We didn't have uh, well, they gave citizenship grants. Yeah. What they called. What them. What were they like? Well, I think they paid. Uh, I got a half citizenship grant. I think that paid me seventy five dollars. For the year. Yeah. What did school cost in those well, days? about three dollars an hour. Yeah. About three dollars an hour. Any was, fees for labs or student activities uh, or things like that? No, very limited. Uh, we, I think that uh, actually for uh, sixty dollars a semester, you that included everything: your books and your uh, the fees and your tuition and and all that. Well, then seventy-five dollars would yeah. take care yeah. of one well, semester too, for you at too least. Bad. Well, yeah. Too bad. Yeah. But there weren't really scholarships in the sense that we know them no. today for athletes. No. I think there's something illegal about them, they thought. Now, who were, do you recall some of the people, uh, some of whom might still be around with us in various ways, uh, who played with you in those days? Yeah. Well, I think uh, mm. probably uh, Bob Matthews, or yeah. if people will remember him. He's in the Hall of Fame out there right. at, at the university. Uh, he was uh, a good ball player. Uh, we had... Uh, we had a lot of farm boys from over in Iowa, uh, Clarence McDermott and Carl Dankoff and uh, Paul Gear, a personal friend of mine oh, from yeah. Iowa. I know Paul. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we, we put on a pretty uh, representative team. A lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, there was some talk when the university now got back in the North Central. Well, we were in the North Central. That's at that right. Time. What? Uh, yeah, at the time you were yeah. in school, you were there, weren't you? We were in the North Central yeah. Conference, and we were quite competitive. Of course, in those days, uh, they played a different brand of football. Everybody did. It wasn't as wide open as it is now. It wasn't as interesting to watch. Pretty much hit the line and oh, fun. Oh yeah, huh? yeah. It was. Uh, they a lot uh, of head knocking, though. Oh yeah. They weren't. Uh, we didn't weren't too uh, tricky. I think they'd scout us about every third year, <laughs> and. Uh, to see what we had, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, Who were the schools in that? In the, what were the schools in the North Central It was pretty much land? the same as now, same? except, uh, well, there was uh, the North Dakota schools, yeah. uh, North Dakota U, North Dakota State, South Dakota U, South Dakota State, Morningside, and uh, Omaha, and then the Iowa State, Iowa Teachers, that was at Cedar Falls. They've changed their name now. Yeah, Northern Iowa. Yeah, and now they've got who? Uh, they have, uh, is Mankato in there now? Yes, Mankato. just coming in in this year of 82. Yeah. And St. Cloud. Yeah, okay. Now, right. uh, but uh, 
We, uh, we had uh, this much difficulty beating North Dakota then as they have now yeah. in basketball. But uh, we ended, I think one year we were second place in the conference in basketball. Well, I imagine some of those schools were getting into the scholarship programs more yeah. than we were as a University well, of Omaha, right? Yeah, we'd, uh, towards the, right before the war, uh, things begin to open up a little bit. But uh, I don't know why they get out of the North Central, maybe partly because of financial reasons. Yeah. You know, with travel and yeah. this, and uh, we didn't have big attendance at those games, you know. And not much income of any sort. No, no, there was very little income from the gate. You know, they tell that story, and I want to say that that's not true about <laughs> the guy calling up, you know, and say, what time does the game start? And they answered, well, what time can you get here? <laughs> now, that wasn't true, <laughs> but they keep telling that story. But, but it was uh, almost that bad, huh? Well, you didn't have to get there early. No. Uh, no you could come in and uh, find a seat. But you know, uh, down playing, that hard Rock'em Sock'em game in those days with not good equipment and not for much in the way of scholarship help to go to college, you know, what was a person's motivation yeah. to play? You yeah. really liked to play, didn't you? Yeah, that was, uh, that's true. You uh, had to love the game. And uh, it was, uh, well, you know, even as late as when I was, uh, you know, I started out there as staff member in 46, and yeah. I was coaching. Uh, I was head basketball in, in 48, and we didn't even have a, practice, a place to practice. So we had to go down to Tech High and practice at night. Yeah. And we had no scholarships then, no scholarships. And those kids, they had to spend their own car fare money and uh, to get down there and practice late at night. And uh, it was, uh, it's a wonder we could field a team, yeah. but we did. And we had some good teams. Uh, I recall, uh, my first game that we played against was with Iowa University oh. in basketball. And uh, we went over there and didn't do too poorly either. We, we took a little jump here, and we'll come back to that again. Your years, uh, when you first came to the university as such as a, as a member of the staff. But now, you're back at college, and uh, you came to UNO, or University of Omaha, of course, and finished out your program there. Then, uh, after you got your degree, you said earlier, you wanted to coach and do things like that. What did you do uh, when you first graduated, Don? Well, when I got out of school in 41, I, uh, I took a teaching job over at Harlan, Iowa, oh, yeah. and uh, I coached and taught there. And uh, I was only there a year because the war, Pearl Harbor in 41, and so I enlisted in June of 42. Oh, yeah. And um, I was in the service uh, from 42 to 46. And sports and things pretty much ground to a halt then anyway. Yes, that's true. I, I still kept pretty active in, uh, in, in sports. When you were in service? service? Did you? Yes. I know they did have some service teams. Yeah, saw I some played on uh, uh, several teams, and uh, uh, we, played, uh, we played some pretty good teams when I was down in Texas. We played uh, Texas A&M. Uh, yeah. Still playing football? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 And, uh, well, you see, that's kind of a military school. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was then, and I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, it was... Uh, it was a, a great, uh, uh, great time in the service. Then, when I got out of the service, why uh, I started the uh, university. Let's uh, take a moment in the last part of this first segment of the tape we're doing. When did the family begin? When did Gene and well, the I family was married. Uh, were you married during I college? Or I got married in April and graduated in June. Oh, 1941. Yeah, and oh. so uh, we um, uh, see. Uh, Followed me around in the service as long as I was in the, uh, in the country. What here. part of service were you in? I was in the Air Force. I see. And uh, so we, she followed me around, but then I was overseas, and they wouldn't let her go. <laughs> and, and so uh, that was. Uh, then we came back. I came back, and then we uh, we got we adopted a couple of girls. And this would be about the mid forties, then. Well, this would be. Uh, well, actually, we didn't make, uh, adopt the two children until about five years after I got back from the oh, service. So it would be in the early 50s. Well, then when you came back from service, you're out of service, what are you going to do? Well, that was it. Ah. I didn't know. I didn't know. I had several jobs offered and uh, selling insurance and things like that, but I didn't think that's what I wanted. And uh, so I came out to university, and uh, at that time, President Haynes yeah, was there. Yeah. and. Uh, I think they might have made a job for me. I don't know. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, I didn't make a lot of money. I no, remember. No. But uh, so I started out there in, uh, in uh, 1946, and uh, stayed out there. I guess was, 
outlived, or not outlived, but uh, I had, uh, what, seven presidents, seven chancellors yeah. all yeah. the time I was there, so. Well, what kind of a job was it? What did it well, include? I was in the uh, phys ed department and uh, assistant coach, and that was the same year that uh, uh, Virgie Elkin started and uh, also Lloyd Cardwell. Oh. And Cardi was hired as football coach, but we didn't have a football team. It wasn't until a year or so later that we actually had a football team. And uh, so... Uh, Sounds like they're really starting to move in the athletic program a little bit. Right. And Harold Jonk was the other staff member we had. No assistant and coaches and no, things like no, that. That was it. That was it. And uh, we did finally, uh, after Cardwell was there a while, we did have a junior varsity team, and I, uh, I coached that, too. We call them uh, the Papooses. But your main intention for coaching was basketball? At that uh, time, that was your, you were head coach in basketball at first? Uh, I was assistant to Harold Jonk in 46, ah. and then he went, uh, uh, he resigned to go back to the farm uh, over in, I think, Hancock, Iowa somewhere. And so then I got the head position. So you came really as an assistant right. to both basketball and football. Right. Any other duties other than sports? Or? No, I, well, I taught uh, head phys ed classes. Oh, yeah. They uh, didn't amount to a whole lot, but that particular time <laughs> we, we uh, threw a ball out and, and uh, it, we didn't have any major in phys ed or anything like that. Uh, At like that time that. when people, let's say like yourself and others, were going to go or wanted to go into coaching uh, and they had a did they get a teaching field in and yeah. some other subject? Usually? Yeah, uh, you had to have uh, you had to be certified in an academic subject, and really the coaching was uh, was uh, incidental. Well, it was they really an extracurricular right. activity. That's huh? right. That's right. They, although I think in many schools they hired you because of your coaching ability, yeah, yeah. not necessarily your teaching ability, but uh, it was. Uh, uh, it's not as uh, professional as it is nowadays. Uh, you, you're, I, I think they come out now, a phys ed major and a, a coach, they come out much better prepared because they have these uh, theory courses yeah. that they can take. We had, we had no uh, uh, academic uh, coursework in, uh, in athletics at that time. They had none, really? No, no, none at all. Well, one other question before we move on a little bit. In those days, in the 40s, after the war, was it, uh, hard or easy for young men and women like yourself to get jobs? We think of it now in 1982 yeah. in a recession period that it's tough. Well, what was it like then? I think that uh, I was lucky. I was only in fact, uh, uh, I only interviewed for two jobs in my life. Yes, one was yeah. at Harlan, Iowa, and one was at, uh, uh, at the university. But uh, uh, things were starting to open up after the war. Uh, uh, the programs that had been discontinued in many of the schools were starting, and of course their enrollment was going up because of the GI Bill. Any idea or remembrance of what the enrollment was like when you came there as a staff member? Oh, I really don't. A couple uh, thousand? I would think day? so. I would think so. The original building, you know, that we had in 38 was yeah. designed for a thousand. Uh -huh. I remember that, and it got to be uh, uh, it was uh, pretty crowded. Put too small almost the first yeah. year. Huh? But of course you realize everything was in that building. Yeah. They, they had uh, no separate library. The library was there in that building. Uh, the bookstore was in that building. Uh, the, all the labs were in that building. Wasn't and the bookstore down on the first floor first somewhere? First floor, right. Yeah. 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 And uh, so the, uh, it became, the, and the cafeteria was in that building. Everything that. was housed in one one building, and then they begin uh, spreading out and getting uh, uh, other buildings. Now, they had 52 acres at that time. I always remember the descriptions of the university having 15, 52 beautiful acres. What else was on that campus other than the main building? Was it all grass, practically? Yeah, and uh, not a very good grade of grass, as <laughs> I remember. It was, uh, there were some corn stalks, and uh, it was uh, pretty primitive. It and, used to uh, be a field. Right, and uh, no trees at all. Uh, in the early pictures that you may see, uh, may have seen of the university, uh, it was uh, bleak. You just see the building, and that was it. Uh, they did have sidewalks around the one building, you know. But then they had uh, a couple of uh, these temporary buildings. That, oh, uh, we we're already getting temporaries. Uh, Out think, and back. Are they still there? Yeah. Uh, well, temporary permanent. Okay. Now uh, we had uh, a student center <laughs> there called the shack. The shack, right? And then. Um, they had an engineering building, 
that uh, uh, shop building. Uh -huh. And I... Uh, uh, that, that was, was another it. temporary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was right. And that was it. That was it, though. Yeah. There was no athletic field, no field house? No, nothing, nothing. Uh, just, uh, uh, it was uh, really... Uh, uh, it did have one feature, though, that, was, that everybody bragged about. It was... Uh, the only completely air-conditioned building yes. or university it at that time. It was a marvelous building, wasn't it? Oh, it, yes. It must have been an impressive one it for the was, whole city, this building. It was, a, a, it has always, and it still was yeah. a beautiful building. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of fond memories of things that went on in there. Well, let's dig into some of those memories. Let's start with, if you can, Don, with um, either, yeah, as a staff member, which you were now shortly after this building was completed, but actually going back a little bit, this move was made out to this building while you were still a student, wasn't it? Yes. Were you involved in the moving at all when they did this transition? Was this one summer? What was it? You remember? Well, we came out, I think, uh, my memory is not as good as it should be. I, I think we started in the, I think we started in the fall term of 1938, as I remember. Brand new building. Brand spanking new, and uh, it was uh, uh, so much better than what we had, uh, the facilities that, uh, uh, the, everybody was uh, thought it was the greatest thing. Yeah, now there was some opposition, I should say, yeah. in the early stages of some of the, well, I couldn't say neighbors because they weren't very close neighbors, but some of the people uh, that thought that uh, things were going to spring up like yeah. hamburger stands right. and uh, uh, tailor shops, I suppose. So they weren't too like happy that. about the university no. moving out there necessarily. No, but uh, it was sort of out of town, wasn't it? Almost, oh, except for a few yes. big estates. Yeah, it was it. Uh, a lot of people wondered why in the world they would build a university out so far west in the cornfield. That was a bit of long, long foresight, right. wasn't it, to pick a beautiful spot, and still is for that particular spot. Yes. They, uh, it, uh, now they've got about every building. I, I don't believe they can get any more uh, buildings in the space that they have there now, unless they go westward. And yeah. They, well, I guess they have plans to do that. Yeah. Now. Going back to the time when the move was made and so on, uh, did they, as they came out, move the whole lock, stock, and barrel school out there, or did they still continue to use no. some of those buildings out in North 24th in any way? No, they thought it, uh, as I recall, it, it was a clean cut. When they moved, they took uh, everything. Did they sell that property off, do you recall? Uh, I don't know. How did that what happen? The, it was the city's operation, really. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. The... Uh, uh, they had some um, faculty buildings that were across the street. They were just houses, what they were, and they were the first to go. Uh, I really don't know what the financial arrangements were on that. Of course, now you know what's there. It's a high-rise uh, uh, building for the ages. Yeah, yeah, on the 24th I think that's Friday. right. And, of course, uh, the Ames, uh, I don't think they really would have to do much knocking to knock that, uh, that science wall down. <laughs> it was pretty well... Uh, deteriorated at that time. So some of the people living there in retirement may be living on their old college campus, actually. Yeah, that's, that could be. That well, could be. Well, let's come back to the university and to the one building which you really had, along with the shack and the engineering quonset or whatever they call it. You were all housed in that one place. Uh, as you recall it, uh, as students, what sorts of programs were available to the students in those days? Well, there... They're quite limited. Uh, we didn't have. We only had one college at that at first, and that was the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Arts and Science, and they had departments like, uh, oh, yeah. where as now they have a College of Education, they had a Department yeah. of Education. Were they in that College? Of yeah, Arts? and I was in that department, but I think there were only three faculty members there, as I recall. Okay. Uh, there was uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, who was he was uh, in that uh, with psychology and education very closely dealt with education yeah. and uh, uh, they had I think three other people and that was that was the department that was the entire department and uh, so naturally the, uh, the the number of classes that they had uh, your uh, course selection uh, was uh, somewhat was somewhat limited not and, too many electives yeah and uh, another bad point too was that that uh, you would have the same professor teaching a different course, you know. You might have him for uh, four or five courses, you know. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, that had some, uh, that wasn't all good. That wasn't mm -hmm. all good. 
Yeah, it really be called a University of Omaha, but it was more like a liberal arts college, right. wasn't it? And then they did mm -hmm. have uh, Dean Helmstetter came as uh, Dean of the College of Applied Arts and Science. Well, that's the second college. That's the second. Then, huh? uh, and they had that was in. About uh, what time? Was that well, be? gee. Roughly. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. uh, forty-nine, fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I could be wrong there. But then uh, I think. Home economics was also connected with that then. Yes, I and, remember that when yeah. I came. Yeah. But uh, then from then on, they uh, came, uh, you know, then we had the College of Business. And I really don't know how many colleges they have now well, fine arts and, yeah, and urban business and, and so business on. And CPACs and yeah. whatever. Well, then really all of these departments eventually branched into college. There was a Department of Business, I suppose, right. too. That's right. All right. right. Dean Lucas, when he was out there, uh, uh, a lot of people remember him as being the dean of the College of Business Administration. But uh, at one time, he was connected in uh, student affairs. He was the dean of students. Uh, ah, I they, got uh, what you eventually had. Yes, right. And uh, then from there, he went on to, uh, uh, although he did, when he was in that administrative job, he also was teaching business and uh, business courses. They, were, they didn't have a lot of professors in business then, uh, Rod Crane and, uh -huh. uh, and uh, maybe four or five professors. Well, the departments were really quite yeah. small, and so right. was, of course, was the enrollment, right? But it was good. In a lot of respects, the students uh, seemed to, uh, there seemed to be a, oh, a, a good rapport between the students and the, and the faculty. They, uh, uh, I think when you get too big, then you outgrow this, and yeah. uh, you don't know the students as well as... Uh, and so you don't know your professors as well. And uh, so there are some advantages of, uh, of being small, I think. And uh, you lose some of that when you get too large. Yeah. What, uh, if you can describe it in a general way, Lee, what kind of students tended to come to our University of Omaha in those days? Were they poor people that couldn't go somewhere else? So what kind, well, I were think they, for other reasons, what re why did people come to our university in those early days? Well, I don't know. I, I think uh, you had a cross-section then as you do now. You had, I know we had some uh, students that came from uh, pretty uh, affluent families and uh, would drive a car. Parking wasn't any problem then, because uh, uh, no, uh, very few had cars. Did they but, have any parking lots? Well, uh, yeah, but uh, they, uh, they weren't kept up very well, and uh, more than one axle was broken in, <laughs> in uh, getting in and out. But I think, uh, to get back to the type of students, yeah. you, had, you had a cross-section. You had those students that uh, were undecided what they wanted to do, and you had some of them that the, they had to help support the family, and they couldn't go far away, and they uh, had to go somewhere where they could uh, uh, afford, mm -hmm. as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but we had then, as we have now, we had those good students and the fair students and the poor students and uh, uh, it's uh, I, I can't see that students have changed a lot although I think nowadays that the students are more involved uh, in what's going on in the policies and they want to become involved in that and uh, didn't take much interest in uh, uh, politics and social programs and so on in those early days no well they did a lot of community things, a lot more in the, for community than they do now. I, I remember like Greek Week and that. They would go out and they would go to an old people's home and they would paint it, you know, and fix it up and clean it up and, and service project. There was a lot more of that type of thing. The fraternity that, program was active in those Oh, days? yes, very much so. And uh, uh, we, had a, we had a good fraternity set, and, I, and I, I'm sure that they do now. But uh, I think that fraternities and, uh, have kind of drifted away from the campus now. Mm -hmm. And there isn't uh, uh, as much, uh, well, and maybe this is, this is good, there's not as much control uh, of what they're doing mm -hmm. in that. And uh, maybe they're doing a good job. Uh, I, I really don't know. Now, uh, excuse me. No, go ahead. Uh, so what you're saying here, Don, as we finish up the second segment of our tape together is that really, over the years, as you reflect on students, whether it's 1938 or 78 or 82, there really isn't a lot of difference between them. That's right. I think, um, well, I, one thing comes to my memory that I always regret, and it was uh, because of uh, 
uh, I think, a certain amount of pressure at that particular time when, and what I'm referring to is that we, uh, when we got rid of the uh, Indians, the name, yes. the nickname Indians, yes. and I, I, I think that that was, in my opinion, and I, I felt that way then, and I still feel that way now, that it was a bad, that we made a mistake there. And it was through primarily student pressure uh, from a very, very few students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, you think we overreacted? Uh, we, we did. We did. The administration did, the faculty did, and uh, some of the students, I think, uh, got carried away. And if they had a revote, I'm not sure it would turn out. But uh, it was, they didn't replace it with anything particularly, uh, in my opinion. And a lot of our tradition went down the drain with mm -hmm. that. And of course, we have Mavericks, and we're, which we're very proud of, and and uh, the athletic teams are doing an outstanding job. But uh, as far as the uh, co-curricular activity program, uh, it never did come back. And maybe it, if that's the way throughout the country, maybe it was that uh, the times mm -hmm. uh, have a lot to mm -hmm. do with it. Don, now we're back on videotape. In the summer of 1982, we visited a bit about the campus, about your early life and your early comings to the University of Omaha campus. And your main intention at the job that you received from President Haynes that day was to be in the athletic program. And as I recall, you were an assistant in football and in basketball. Right. And uh, some of the other names that were a part of that small athletic department in those days yeah. as you began. Okay. Uh, Berger Yalkin was hired as athletic director. He came right as athletic director. He came as, as athletic director and, uh, as I recall, baseball coach. Let's pause with Verge because he's gone from us now as we visit in 82. Uh, did he come, has he been a coach other places, that sort of thing? Yes, he was a high school coach in, um, at Fremont, and uh, I believe he had some coaching experience in Lincoln. Right. But uh, I think uh, he came directly to us from, uh, well, he came directly to us, I think, from the service. Uh -huh. But prior to that, he was uh, coaching high school coaching. I see. And then uh, Lloyd Cardwell, which yeah. uh, we all know, uh, he came as hired as a football coach. And uh, then uh, I think the following year, they hired assistant coach, uh, uh, who was a famous football player at uh, uh, at Nebraska, and went on to play professional ball. Uh, Charlie Brock. Oh yes, I used to hear about him on the radio in the great games against Minnesota. Yeah, right, he days. was a center down there, yes. and he coached the line here. He was a wonderful coach. And uh, uh, now that's the first expansion as a couple of coaches. Almost, that's right. Huh? That's all right. And then uh, the uh, next addition would uh, be Ernie Gore, who oh, yeah. came from high school, high school over at uh, Nebraska City. What did Ernie come to do? Uh, he came as assistant coach, and uh, he was involved in track, but not as a head coach. Well, he, didn't he still live in Nebraska City, though? He lived in Nebraska City, and uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, he would hop on a bus and commute from uh, uh, Nebraska City to Omaha. Uh, and I don't know how long he did that. Um, quite a spell, quite a Is while, right? yeah, and uh, then uh, he moved in, he moved into Omaha. Now, the sports that you were primarily involved with, though, were basketball and football. That's right. All right, I, uh, we finally, uh, we had a, um, a pretty good turnout for football, and so it was decided to, uh, since we had a large enough squad, we'd have a junior varsity team. And oh. uh, so uh, I was uh, appointed a junior varsity coach. When and did we this begin, 47 or so? Well, uh, no, it must have been 40, uh, 49, I uh -huh. believe, around uh -huh. 49. And we used to play junior colleges uh, around. What's and, the, what are some of the schools you played? Oh, Fairbury Junior College, and we played uh, uh, Concordia College. Out of Seward? And, yeah, and Dana College. and. Uh, uh, we had, I think, four or five games on the on the schedule, and uh, we had some good ball players. That's quite a bit of extension yeah. to be able to have a junior right. varsity team. Right. Was the game changing from when you played it very much yet? Oh, very much so. Uh, we uh, uh, then they ran from the single wing, you know. All and, single uh, wing. Huh? Uh, you knew what they were going to do, but you couldn't do much about it a lot of times. But then they developed passing pattern off of a single wing, which gave it quite a bit of deception. Passing wasn't much part of the game, was it? 
well, than there is until uh, about now. Yeah, it was nothing like it is now. It's, well, wasn't one of the reasons for that the shape of the football? That's right. The shape of the football was uh, or kind of around. Yeah. And uh, that's one reason. A lot of times they had what they called drop kicks. Oh, I was, nobody, I was just thinking about that. Nobody ever drop kicks anymore. Describe but, that, because I've had a lot of people who might well, watch this tape don't even know what that is. Uh, that was just like uh, kicking a field goal. Only one guy would do it. The ball would be centered from the uh, the ball would come to you from the center. He would get it and drop it, and at the same time kick it. And we had some people that could drop that uh, drop kick that thing 40 yards. It was long. really an art, wasn't it? And a lot of times extra points were done by the drop kicking method. And uh, you didn't have to worry about a person fumbling it, no, uh, no. setting it up. He and held and it. One guy handled it all the time, and uh, but it, uh, it. I don't even know if. Uh, anybody drop kicks anymore. Uh, well, the shape of the football yeah, would make would, it difficult, would, I suppose. It's it really a smaller bounce. ball, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would bounce, I think, oddly, and, and uh, you wouldn't uh, get the control that you had on it. But, you mentioned uh, the junior varsity there, and the four or five junior colleges, and Dan and so on that you played. This means the program was expanding a little bit. Yes. We had, uh, I think most people remember Joe Arenas now. Oh, he was yeah. going to play on the junior varsity, and about... Uh, you know, Joe never played high school football. Is that right? Never played. He was a good basketball player, and uh, uh, but he never played uh, football in high school. And so he was working out with the junior varsity. We were running the scout plays, you know, for the, against the varsity for the team. You know, we ran the plays of the team that they were going to play. And Joe did so well that uh, uh, Cardi moved him up on the varsity, <laughs> and uh, he, I, he never uh, he never played junior varsity. But uh, and he turned out to be quite a quite a a ball he player. The pro ball yeah, he gone. played with the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, and yeah. I believe he's still uh, coaching uh, part-time anyway down at uh, University of Houston. Oh, is that time. right? Yeah. But we had, uh, we had some good, uh, pretty good uh, ball players. Uh, we had uh, Fred Pasali, as I remember, who's a coach, uh, uh, teacher at Benson. He was on the junior varsity. He was an outstanding tennis player, probably the outstanding tennis player uh, in the city at that time. Mm -hmm. Oh, say, I forgot to tell you that I also was appointed tennis coach, and I didn't know anything about tennis. But I was... They uh, needed a body, huh? I uh, stand on my record. My record's the best uh, of any that they ever had out of the university. Right? It wasn't because of me. It was the players. And we, uh, uh, I think like that Fred, huh? we only lost one match, I believe. And uh, we played teams like uh, Kansas and Iowa State and Nebraska. And wow, you went to the squad. Well, we had a good... Uh, I was kind of the business manager. <laughs> I didn't know anything about uh, tennis. That was something to occupy your time in the spring yeah. a little bit, and they needed help there. But I didn't get paid for it uh, either. So, uh, But anyway, it was just one of those things in addition to your other duties. Was that about the time they started intercollegiate tennis? Yeah, that was uh, when it was uh, uh, in the embryonic stage. Late 40s yeah. then, really. Yeah. So the sports we, program was well, really getting a little bigger, really. We had, um, we had uh, some... Uh, tennis before that, but it didn't mount anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, then to get a schedule, but tennis is a, a money loser, you know. Yeah. You don't make any money on tennis because uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, it's uh, you put out for travel and that and meals and you don't get any guarantees right. or anything. It's just kind of a home and home basis. It's sort of like the early days of your football and basketball as a student. The crowds were small. That's right. Or That's non-existent right. almost. Yeah, well, yeah. now, the way you, you're inferring, I think, by that, if that's so, that uh, in those years when your your coaching staff increased, the student body was getting a little bigger, that sort of thing, the program was on the upswing. Did that mean that uh, sports like basketball and football were drawing bigger crowds and taking in a little money? Yeah, we we began to make uh, we began to make a little money, and uh, like I say, we played uh, Iowa University, and we made enough money on that trip to buy uniforms. You know, uh, you didn't have special uniforms at all. Well, we had, uh, the uniforms we had were uh, left much to be desired. So we equipped ourselves with uh, uh, with new uniforms, and uh, it was a, uh, uh, that was when we started to make a little money uh -huh. on, on guarantees and that. Now, you mentioned Iowa University. It, was that at the time, had you moved now into the head of basketball? Yes. All right. What that, year was that? That was 1948. In fact, that was my first game, my uh -huh. first varsity game. What a way to start. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they, I think that we, um, at the half, they were only about two points ahead. What but, kind of scores did we have in those days? Well, they were small. They were low. I think the final... You ball a lot, didn't you? Oh, yes. They bring that ball back, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, 
they, uh, I, uh, I, I think they had a, a little guy over there named Ware uh, who was playing at that I time. I remember he the was name. American, I believe. Yes. But I think we were unethical in one respect. We used a zone defense, and the Big Ten, I think they had a gentleman's agreement. They weren't supposed to use the, the <laughs> zone defense, and so 